Okay, program number four this afternoon, and uh, we're glad that you stay with us. And uh, again, I always want to show my appreciation to you folks. I know some of you drive quite a ways to come in for these tapings, and we do. We thank you from the depths of our heart. And again, for those of you out in television, we want to thank you for your prayers, your letters of comfort, and uh, what else we call them, honey? I mean, they are just a thrill to read. Once in a great while, we get one that, uh, not mean, but you know, they, uh, for what reason or ever, uh, I don't let them bother me. But uh, 99 out of 100 are so thrilling and uh, showing that the Lord is opening His Word. And uh, that's all we really want to do. And so, how else can I put it but that we thank you out there. Okay, let's get right back in. We're in Book 66, remember? And uh, the last four programs uh, will be the next taping, won't they? These are the middle four. So, uh, for this half hour, let's just continue where we've been all afternoon. I didn't intend to do this. I thought I'd be on another but now by now, but uh, th th this is too important to just leave hanging by a thread, so I'm going to stay with it through this next half hour, how that Peter had an understanding now that when he made his profession of faith back there in Matthew, at the end of the three years of earthly ministry, he had now a picture of all of these promises that God had made to the nation of Israel concerning this coming king and kingdom, that he be a redeemer, as well as Messiah. All right, now Israel rejected it, according to God's divine purposes, of course. And uh, God raised him from the dead, called him back to glory, and now the twelve are left in a dilemma. They don't know how long until he will return and yet bring in the kingdom. They're still on that hope. And uh, they have this hope now, of course, because he's alive. He's not in the tomb, he's alive. And he is at the Father's right hand, and according to Psalms 110, verse 1, when he had all of his enemies like a footstool, which would come at the end of the tribulation, he would return. And when he returns, he would yet bring in this glorious kingdom. And of course, I think these men had the idea it was still going to be in their lifetime until they got nearly to the end. Now, of course, we know that uh, Jesus implied that Peter would suffer death, but you know, we're all prone, to, uh, we put these bad things aside. <laughs> we just sort of forget about them. And I think Peter was the same way. He'd forgotten all about that until he got to the end of his life when he suddenly realized that Christ was not coming and that he would be a martyr instead. But let's pick him up again in Acts now, chapter 2. And Peter, of course, is fired up that all oh, the hope of Israel is the return now of their crucified, resurrected Messiah, but he doesn't associate one iota of salvation to it. And that's what I want people to see. Just watch the language. He does not say that by believing in the death and burial and resurrection of Christ, they would have ex uh, salvation experience. It's only believing who he was. That was the crux of the kingdom gospel, to believe that Jesus was the Christ and the law and everything is still in place. Not a word, not a word that they were to stop temple worship. Not a word that they were to stop keeping the Jewish laws of food and what have you. Not a word that they were to stop Saturday Sabbath keeping at the synagogue. And so be aware of that. It's just not in here. All right, so we were down to about verse 24 in our last half hour, so let's move on to verse 25. And see, now Peter is referring his readers constantly back to the Old Testament prophets because, like Paul said, he was the minister to the nation of Israel to fulfill the promises made to the, prophet, to the fathers. And Peter is homing in on this. He's reminding them, this is all as a result of fulfilled prophecy. Now verse 25, David in the Psalms speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest 
in hope. Now, verse 27, he's quoting literally the Lord Jesus himself in his death and burial. And so he says, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. That was the paradise side. You remember Luke shows us torment on one side, paradise on the other. Jesus did not go into the flames of torment like some teach. He went into the paradise side. And I always tell people, what did Jesus tell the thief on the cross? Today thou shalt be with me in the flames of hell. <coughs> did he? No. And that's what some teach, you know. Famous people are saying that. No, he said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And then Paul makes it so plain. But what is it that he descended first and then ascended up? taking captivity captive. He didn't go into the lost realms of hell. He went into the paradise side of that area called hell or Hades and took those believing Old Testament saints with him up into paradise now in heaven. All right, so he says, Thou wilt not leave my soul down in the neither parts of the earth or in the paradise area, neither wilt thou permit thy Holy One to see corruption. His body never had one iota of corruption in those three days. Not a bit. All right, now verse 28. It's still from the pen of David, but remember he's putting the words of the Lord Jesus himself in prophetic form. Verse 28, Thou hast made known unto me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Now then verse 29 Peter comes back to the reality of his own day. And he says, men and brethren, fellow Jews, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is dead and buried. And his sepulcher is with us to this day. David was not raised and gone up to glory. He was speaking of the Christ. See? All right, now verse 30. Therefore, being a prophet. Now, most people don't usually speak of David as a prophecy writer, but he was. He wrote a lot of prophecy, especially concerning the crucifixion. Psalms 22 is graphic. We, we've used it on the program. All right? But David is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. All right, now in a few words, what's that telling us? The house of David, that royal lineage that began with King David and came all the way down to Christ's birth at Bethlehem that this was all in the promises made to David that out of the fruit of his loin, out of his genealogy, and I always use two lines because you've got the genealogy of Joseph, his legal father, on one side. You've got the genealogy of Mary on the other side, and they culminate with the birth of Christ. That's the house of David coming to fulfillment. All right, that's what Peter is showing. It was all prophesied that beginning with David's bloodlines, Christ would come on the scene and would one day sit on David's throne. Now verse 31, if you think I'm pulling your leg. He, seeing this before, spake of what? The resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in hell, again, in the paradise side of hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. Now verse 32, this Jesus, this Messiah, this Son of God, hath God raised up from the dead, whereof we are all witnesses. Now verse 33, therefore, Peter says, being by the right hand of God, not on God's throne, at the right hand of God, being exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has shed forth this, on this day of Pentecost now in Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit has come down, 
which you now see and hear. Now he comes back to David again. He says, David isn't ascended into the heavens. David's remains are still in the tomb. David hasn't ascended into the heavens, but he said to himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until, I always make the point, that's a time word, he's going to sit at the Father's right hand until it's time to return to planet Earth. And that won't happen until he has defeated all of his enemies, which will take place, of course, in the seven years of tribulation. All right? So he says, until I make thy foes thy, thy, foes thy footstool. That's Psalms 110, verse 1. All right, now the next verse. Therefore, and again, watch the language. Therefore, let all the house of Israel. Now that's a double-barreled statement. How many people today are still teaching that there's only two tribes of Israel left? that the ten were lost and disappeared. Well, then Peter could not say the whole house of Israel. That's only two-tenths. But they are all here. In fact, I told one of my callers the other day, I'd rent my whole ranch, cattle, machinery, the whole shebang on the fact that I think all 12 tribes are already represented in Israel right now today. I think we're that close to the end. And when the two witnesses appear and it's time to choose 144,000 young Jewish men, 12,000 from every one of the 12 tribes, I think they're all ready to go. Now that's my own take. That's all it's worth. But 10 tribes did not disappear. They had all been migrating down into Judah over the years. Yes, what was left, the Assyrians took captive, but that was just only a small remnant of the whole. The rest were already back down in the environment of the temple and Jerusalem and the two tribes, so that when the Babylonian captivity came in, all 12 tribes were represented. And when you read Ezra and Nehemiah, it's so obvious that when they came back to Jerusalem, all 12 tribes were represented. So don't believe this garbage that 10 tribes are gone, there's only two left. Then this whole book would fall apart. Because Revelation says as plain as day, there has to be 12,000 from each one of the 12 tribes. Well, that can't happen if 10 of them are gone. Okay, so now back to verse 36. The whole house of Israel, every tribe represented. Therefore, let the whole house of Israel, and how many Gentiles? Not a one. He doesn't include a Gentile. This is a Jewish message. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, Lord and... Now remember the word Christ is what again? Messiah. He hasn't stopped the potential of being the Messiah of Israel. The crucifixion was something that God pre-planned for the salvation of mankind, but it didn't affect his Messiahship and so Peter is not recognizing anything pertaining to the death, burial, and resurrection except that Israel in unbelief rejected him and killed him, but God proved his power by raising from the dead, and he can still bring in the kingdom. Now we'll show you that in the next few verses. All right, now verse 37. Of course, they begin to have second thoughts. Well, Peter, you're proven that we did. We killed our Messiah. And so then you come to the end of verse 37. Naturally, men and brethren, what shall we do? The nation, they're in a dilemma. They've rejected their Messiah. They killed him. And God raised him from the dead. So now what do we do? That's logical, isn't it? And now look at Peter's answer. Peter said, repent and be baptized. Yes, that was part of the kingdom message. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness or the remission of sin, and then they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, we did it on our Aegean cruise. I laid it out just as plainly one night in our Bible class that here we have Peter's process for salvation laid out as plain as English can make it. Repentance. Water baptism, 
the forgiveness of sin, and then the Holy Spirit. Plain as day. But then when he gets over to the house of Gentiles, poor old Peter was all shook up. It didn't work that way. While he's still preaching, the Romans had become believers. God had forgiven them. The Holy Spirit came upon them. And not a drop of water had touched them. Boy, that puts a lot of preachers in a dilemma even today. Well, Peter was up against the same thing. So what's the first thing he says? Hey, we got to baptize them. After the fact. But see, here in this chapter 2, he makes it so plain what the Jew had to do to have salvation, having rejected their Messiah. He doesn't associate anything about the shed blood. Not a word of that in here. Not a word about all the power of resurrection for their salvation. You believe that the one you rejected, repent of it, and you can have salvation. All right, now, if you doubt me, let's go on. A little fear. Uh, saw the word fear. <laughs> Chapter 3. Now he's going to heal the lame man. And the language hasn't changed a bit. Verse 12. Verse 12. He's just healed the lame man there at the gates of the, the door of the temple. And when Peter saw the consternation of the Jewish people, he answered and said to the people, now watch the language, ye men of Israel, not a word about Gentiles, ye men of Israel, why marvel at this, this healing of this lame man? Why look earnestly on us as though by our power or holiness we made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers. Any Gentiles in that term? Not a one. Can't be. He is talking to a Jewish situation. The God of our fathers hath glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up, and denied in the presence of Pilate when he determined to let him go. You denied the Holy One and the just, and you desired a murderer to be granted unto you. You killed the Prince of Life. My, he's laying it on him, isn't he? Now you talk about a guilt trip. That's a guilt trip. But it was true. They were nationally guilty. But what was their remedy? Repent of it. See, that's why repentance was so imperative here. I guess I got time. I'm going to explain. I have people calling all the time. They get upset because I do not maintain you have to repent to be saved today. Paul doesn't teach it. And you see, the reason is they're trying to use these verses in Acts and hammer it home today. Well, you see, Israel had every reason in the world to repent. They had killed their promised Messiah. You and I are not responsible for that. In fact, I always have to think a long time ago. We want a fellow to the Lord who was probably as ungodly as they come in every category of life. And he was gloriously saved. And sometime later, he said, you know, Les, he said, something bothers me. He said, I keep hearing all the time, you've got to repent, repent. He says, I never repented when I got saved. And he says, I didn't realize there was anything to repent of. He said, everything I was doing came naturally. I said, you're right. That's exactly the way it is. We don't have a great big uh, conviction of sin because we're not aware of all these things. We're just doing what comes naturally in our lost estate. And so Paul doesn't require repentance. Paul requires only one thing, and that is what? Believe it. Faith. Now then, here's where I get back at him. Yes, as soon as you believe the gospel and God works the work of salvation in your heart and life, what are you going to do? You're going to change direction. You're going to repent if that's what you want to use. But to use it for salvation today, hey, it's as wrong as wrong can be because, again, repentance is a work. You can make up your own mind, hey, I'm going to change my life. I'm going to do different. That doesn't save you. But I'll tell you what, when the Holy Spirit comes in and He makes a difference in your life, then you don't have any trouble changing direction. So don't fall for this stuff that if you haven't repented, God can't save you because 
Israel knew where they had gone off the deep end. They had killed their Messiah. And they had to repent of that and that in particular in order to attain salvation. But for us, we believe it, as we're going to see before the end of the half hour. And then salvation comes in and we're going to change our direction or we're going to have repentance. All right, but now let's continue on where we left off in Acts chapter 3. And Peter has healed the lame man. And he's still dealing on Jewish ground. Now then he comes down to verse 7, no, verse 16. Verse 16, he's explaining how this lame man had experienced physical healing. And he says, verse 16, his name through faith in his death, burial, and resurrection hath made this man whole. Is that what your Bible says? What does it say? Faith in his what? His name. And what did the name imply? He was the Messiah. And we come right back to square one. What was Peter's confession of faith? Thou art the Messiah. That's all. And it's no different here. This lame man believed who Jesus was. And on that basis, God healed him. Not a word about death, burial, and resurrection. Not a word about shed blood yet. It's all in believing who he really was. All right, now then. Come all the way down to verse 19 again. Repent. And it's the same scenario. Repent of having rejected your Messiah. Repent, therefore, and be converted. Have a change of mind. Have a change of direction. That your sins can be blotted out. And when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now, he's not just talking about the glorious Christian life. What's he talking about? The kingdom. Because if Israel would have repented, and if Israel to the last man would have come into this kind of salvation, now look at verse 20. What would God do? And he will send Jesus Christ, who before was preached unto you. And what was he preached as? The coming king. And God would fulfill it if Israel would have repented and become a believing nation. But they would not, see? But that was the whole idea. Repent of having killed your Messiah, and if you do it to the last Jew, God will send Jesus Christ to yet bring in the kingdom. All right, but verse 21, Peter knows, according to the Old Testament, even as prosperous as all, or as a, a, what's the word I'm looking for? As a possibility that this was, Yet Peter knew there was one seven-year interval that they still had to go through. And what was it? Tribulation. They would have to go through the tribulation because that was prophecy. You can't kick some parts of prophecy out under any circumstance. And so God has to maintain all these things. And so Peter says in verse 21, Whom heaven must receive, that is, when he ascended to sit at the Father's right hand, until, see, there's the time word, he would have to stay in heaven until the times of restitution or putting everything back as it was in the beginning, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the ages began. And what was it? That after these horrible seven years of wrath and vexation, then Christ would return, the earth would be made as it was in the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, and the king and his kingdom would become a reality. And these people thought that they were going to live to see the day. They thought it would just be a matter of seven, eight, nine years, and it would all be culminated. No idea that it was going to be pushed out for 2,000 years. All right, now then, let me bring you on down in this same chapter 3, verse 24. He says, Yea, all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many have spoken, have foretold of these days. Why does he mention Samuel? Because Samuel is in the time of David. And David is when these promises really began to be understandable. All right, now then, he says in verse 25, You are the children of the prophets. Now that doesn't include Gentiles. There's not a Gentile involved in Peter's thinking. 
You are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers when he said unto Abraham, In thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, that is the nation of Israel, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. That was the promise. But did they do it? No. They rejected and they rejected. And when Stephen makes the final appeal in Acts chapter 7, they stone Stephen and then were introduced to the other side of the coin, which we now call the gospel of the grace of God. And who is it? Saul of Tarsus. My, it's beautiful how Scripture just keeps unfolding. All right, go with me. Back to chapter 7, and we have the stoning of Stephen. You're all acquainted with that. Now come into chapter 8, verse 1, honey. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And here we're introduced to the next major player on God's stage of biblical history. And Saul was consenting unto his death, there was a great persecution against the assembly, which was at Jerusalem. They were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. See, the twelve didn't go out into the world preaching the gospel. They stayed in Jerusalem. What are you going to believe, Christendom or the book? Well, the book says they stayed in Jerusalem. All right, now then, we'll just make one quick reference to it. Now I'm going to bring you over to... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, only have a few seconds left, so we'll do this quickly. <clears throat> now, whereas Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, look what this next apostle writes to the Corinthian church and to you and I today. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize but preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Now here it comes. For the preaching of the cross, to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. What a difference. Now you see, all Paul knows is that salvation comes by only one way, believing the gospel. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick.